An 11-year-old girl became the foremost affluent young black girl globally. She hailed from a lineage connected to an enslaved ancestor and grew up in one of the most economically disadvantaged households in the United States. By the time she turned 12, she had garnered the attention of four individuals seeking her hand in marriage, solely driven by her immense wealth. If you're new to our YouTube channel, we extend a warm welcome to Histrans. Please remember to show your support by liking and subscribing as we explore the captivating narrative of the youngest black millionaire in history. Her family were African-American farmers in the heart of a segregated America. They were confined to the poorest areas of town, living a menial lifestyle and facing degrading reminders of the enduring effects of slavery. Their property had two mortgages, putting it at risk of foreclosure. For a young girl like Sarah, her realistic prospects in life might be limited to demanding domestic work or agricultural labor. If she were fortunate, she could become a teacher in a segregated and underfunded local school. However, most other occupations were simply inaccessible to poor and working-class African-American women. Similar to many other African-American families from Oklahoma, the rector's ancestors had been enslaved by the Creek tribe. This meant that Sarah and her older siblings were eligible to be included in the Creek Nation's Freedmen Roll, which, according to federal law, entitled them to receive free land allotments. TOA large extent, the program served as a temporary solution to a dread's long-standing mistreatment. Sarah's parcel was situated approximately 100 miles northwest of their town, rendering it impractical for the family's farming activities. Moreover, the supposedly free land came with significant drawbacks. The properties allocated to black residents often had infertile soil and carried a substantial annual tax burden. One observer described Sarah's plot as an unproductive piece of land. Joe Rector, a diligent provider for his family, vehemently opposed his children having any involvement with the allotted plots. He sought permission from the Muscogee County Court to sell the land for a few hundred dollars, but no buyer could be found. Regardless of Joe's efforts, it seemed that he was stuck with the properties. Joe made the decision to enter into a lease agreement with an oil company for Sarah's land. The lease alleviated some of the tax obligations and included a royalty provision if oil was discovered. The allotment had the potential to transform from an onerous burden into a manageable inconvenience. On that specific day, August 29, 1913, Sarah continued her arduous manual labor, which contributed to supporting her family. Being far away from her plot, she couldn't see the numerous drilling rigs on the horizon penetrating the ground. She remained unaware of the oil beginning to surge to the surface and the subsequent gush that followed. As one newspaper later remarked, even if Sarah had stumbled upon Aladdin's lamp, she could not have wished for a more extraordinary turn of events. It was an abundant oil well. Unbeknownst to her at that moment, Sarah Rector, a daughter of impoverished farmers, had suddenly transformed into a promising entrepreneur. Her property yielded approximately 2,500 barrels of oil per day, making it the largest producing well in one of the country's major oil fields. From the initial oil gusher alone, Sarah stood to earn more than a roan 114,000 per year, which equates to nearly $3 million in today's currency. Curiosity about Sarah Rector, her remarkable stroke of luck, and particularly her wealth spread rapidly and many individuals would stop at nothing to acquire it for themselves. Sarah clutched the first payment she received directly as royalties, $5.25, which amounts to approximately $138 in today's value. Although it constituted a small fraction of the vast sum pouring into the bank, it felt like hitting the jackpot for the young girl a symbol of a different life. The world she knew was modest, yet cherished. Taft, her all-black community, boasted a population of fewer than 400 individuals who nurtured thriving establishments along Main Street. These included family-owned restaurants, a bakery, a barbershop, a shoe repair store, and a handful of grocery stores all prominently featured in the town's unassuming newspaper. As one local resident aptly described it, for black Americans enduring the harsh realities of Jim Crow, Taft was unparalleled and provided a sense of belonging. For Sarah, 
patronizing black-owned businesses and running errands with her family, stood in stark contrast to the bustling city of Muskogee, located just 10 miles to the east. Now Sarah purchased a fresh outfit, she struggled to adjust to her new everyday footwear. However, she couldn't deny their practicality. After all, Sarah had to walk two miles to the local school every day from their family's cabin made of sawn lumber. The cabin consisted of two rooms with a single bed. Sarah slept on a natural fiber mat on the floor. None of this was uncommon or a cause for embarrassment in Taft. Then a brand new carriage, an open vehicle with large, sturdy wheels, arrived at the cabin. The carriage had a lap blanket to keep the rider warm. It felt like a personal chariot for the 11-year-old girl, attracting more attention to her. Sarah harnessed a horse to the carriage and trotted into the center of Taft to go to school. The recently installed streetlights illuminated her newfound fortune for her friends, classmates, and teachers to see. The newly acquired funds also allowed for upgrades to the farm. Chicken coops and a new barn provided more space for the animals. A smokehouse expanded the kitchen's capacity, and a well eliminated the laborious task of hauling buckets for water. An oil stove improved cooking during the summer. The children could witness an even more remarkable project taking shape nearby on the family's farm. A brand new two-story wooden house was now being constructed before their eyes. Once it was completed, they furnished it with store-bought furniture, a luxury that became a reality to celebrate. Rose, Sarah's mother, would select a stunning new wardrobe for herself. Perhaps the most thrilling for Sarah were two luxuries inside the house that would have been unimaginable before, a record player and a piano. Sarah, who was rumored to possess musical talent, sat with her fingers on the keys of a piano that was worth as much as the annual income of many black families. Drills hummed with activity across Sarah's property. The unexpected discovery was no coincidence. An astonishing 3,800 barrels of valuable liquid now flowed daily. Observers anticipated that Sarah would achieve unprecedented wealth as one of the most affluent African-American women in the history of the United States, resulting in her shouldering the largest tax burden in all of Oklahoma. All inspiring calculations indicated that her annual income would surpass that of the President of the United States. She was likened to the courageous protagonist of a fairy tale. A decade prior to the captivating national fame of Little Orphan Annie, a comic strip depicting the sudden wealth of a destitute white girl, Little Sarah Rector, as some journalists referred to her, became a sensation that resonated across the country. It is not surprising, given the widespread myth-making, that at one point a newspaper mistakenly described Sarah as an orphan, which was not the case. Sarah received an influx of mail from strangers vying for her attention. The letters varied from manipulative to unabashedly demanding. From various locations such as Boston and Seattle, correspondents pleaded for a substantial portion, often a significant sum of Sarah's wealth. One woman from New York boldly requested $1 million, claiming it would benefit the less fortunate. Almost immediately, a wave of suitors, some of whom were white men with no qualms about supporting racist Jim Crow laws, sent letters proposing marriage. This was despite the fact that Sarah had just turned 12 years old. Some suitors even included photographs of themselves, while others mailed their letters from international destinations. The secretary of a men's matchmaking club focused on facilitating connections within the black community, laid claim to Sarah for himself. Sarah reportedly simply desired to continue living her usual carefree life. She displayed no interest in entertaining potential partners. However, as public opinions accumulated, two recurring ideas emerged. One suggested that Sarah now symbolized her entire race, although this notion was unjust. The reasoning behind this notion was that she had been blessed with incredible good fortune, which came with the responsibility to represent her people. On the other hand, there was a conflicting notion questioning her place among the privileged class to which her wealth elevated her. Sarah may have been young, shy, and inexperienced in the broader world, but a new mission became evident to prove her readiness and silence the skeptics. Thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe.